Hi everybody, welcome to another story time with Sid. It is me, Sydney of Hightower, as it is every week, and here we are again with another story. We're back to fairies. Who's surprised? Not me. It's kind of my favorite thing in the entire world. So, let's get started. This week's story is... Ethna the Bride. The fairies, as we know, are greatly attracted by the beauty of mortal women, and Finvada, the king, employs his numerous sprites to find out and carry off, when possible, the prettiest girls and brides in the country. These are spirited away by enchantment to his fairy palace at Nakma and Tuam, where they remain under a fairy spell, forgetting all about the earthly life and soothed to passive enjoyment. As in a sweet dream, by the soft low melody of the fairy music, which has the power to lull the hearer into a trance of ecstasy. There was once a great lord in that part of the country who had a beautiful wife called Ethna, the loveliest bride in all the land. And her husband was so proud of her that day after day he had festivals in her honor, and from morning till night his castle was filled with lords and ladies, and nothing but music and dancing and feasting and hunting and pleasure was thought of. One evening, while the feast was merriest, and Ethna floated through the dance in a robe of silver gossamer, clasped with jewels, more bright and beautiful than the stars in the heaven, she suddenly let go of the hand of her partner and sank to the floor in a faint. They carried her to her room where she lay long and, and insensible, but towards the morning she woke up and declared that she had passed the night in a beautiful palace and was so happy that she longed to sleep again and go there in her dreams. And they watched her all the day, but when the shades of evening fell dark in the castle, low music was heard at her window, and Ethna again fell into a deep trance from which nothing could rouse her. Then her old nurse was set to watch her, but the woman grew weary in the silence and fell asleep, and never awoke till the sun had risen. And when she looked towards the bed, she saw to her horror the young bride had disappeared. The whole household was ro roused up at once, and search made everywhere. But no trace of her could be found in all the castle, nor in the gardens, nor in the park. Her husband sent messengers in every direction, but to no purpose. No one had seen her. No sign of her could be found, living or dead. Then, the young lord mounted his swiftest steed and galloped right off to Nakama to question Finvada, the fairy king, if he could give any tidings of the bride or direct him where to search for her. For he and Finvada were friends, and many a good keg of Spanish wine had been left outside the window of the castle at night for the fairies to carry away, by order of the young lord. But he little dreamed now that Finvada himself was the traitor, so he galloped on like mad until he'd reached Nakama, the hill of the fairies. And as he stopped to rest his horse by the fairy wrath, he heard voices in the air above him, and one said, Right glad is Finvada now, for he is a beautiful bride in the, his palace at last, and never more will she see her husband's face. Yet, answered another, if he dig down through the hill to the center of the earth, he would find his bride. But the work is hard, and the way is difficult, and Finvada has more power than any mortal man. That is yet to be seen, exclaimed the young lord. Neither fairy nor devil nor Finvada himself shall stand between me and my young wife. And on the instant he sent word to his servants to gather all together the workmen and the laborers on the country round with their spades and pickaxes to dig through the hill till they came upon the fairy palace. And the workmen came, a great crowd of them, and they dug through the hill and that day till the great deep trench was made down to the very center. Then at sunset they left off for the night. But next morning, when they assembled again to continue their work, behold, all the clay was put back again into the trench, and the hill looked as if never a spade had touched it. For Finvada had ordered, and he was powerful over earth and land and sea. But the young lord had a brave heart, and he made the men go on with the work, and the trench was dug again, wide and deep in the center of the hill, and this went on for three days but always with the same result, for the clay was put back again each night, and the hill looked the same as before, and they were no nearer to the fairy palace. Then the young lord was ready to die for rage and grief, but suddenly he heard a voice near him like a whisper in the air, and the words it said were this, Sprinkle the earth you have dug up with salt, and your work will be safe. On this, New life came into his heart, and he sent word to the country to gather salt from the people, and the clay was sprinkled with it that night, when the men had left their work at the hill. Next morning they all rose up early in great anxiety to see what had happened, 
And there, to their great joy, was a trench all safe, just as they left it, and the earth round it was untouched. Then the young lord knew he had power over Finvara, and he bade the men work on with good heart, for they would soon reach the fairy palace now in the center of the hill. So by the next day, a great glen was cut through the deep down the middle of the earth, and they could hear the fairy music as if they put their ear close to the ground, and voices were heard round them in the air. See now, said one, Finvara is sad, for if one of those mortal men strike a blow to the fairy palace with their spades, it will crumble to dust and fade away like the mist. Then let Finvara give up the bride, said another, and we shall be safe. On which... The voice of Finvara himself was heard, clear like the note of, a, note of a silver bugle through the hill. Stop your work, he said. O men of earth, lay down your spades, and at sunset the bride shall be given back to her husband. I, Finvara, have spoken. Then the young lord bade them to stop their work and lay down their spades till the sun went down. And at sunset he mounted his great chestnut seed and rode to the hedge of the glen and watched and waited, and just as the red light flushed the sky, he saw his wife coming along the path in her robe of silver gossamer, more beautiful than ever, and he sprang from the saddle and lifted her up before him and rode away like a storm of the wind back to the castle, and there they laid Athna on her bed, but she closed her eyes and spake no word. So day after day passed, and still she never spake or smiled, but seemed like one in a trance, and a great sorrow fell upon everyone, for they feared she'd eaten of the fairy food, and that the enchantment would never be broken. So her husband was very miserable. But one evening, as he was riding home late, he heard voices in the air, and one of them said, It is now a year and a day since the young lord brought home his beautiful wife from Finvara. But what good is she to him? She is speechless and one like the dead, for her spirit is with the fairies, though her form is there beside him. Then another voice answered, And so she will remain unless the spell is broken. He must unloose the girdle from her waist that is fastened with the enchanted pin, and burn the girdle with fire, and throw the ashes before the door, and bury the enchanted pin in the earth. Then will her spirit come back from fairyland, and she will once more speak, and have true life. Hearing this, the young lord at once set spurs to his horse, and on reaching his castle, hastened to the room where Ethna lay on her couch, silent and beautiful, like a waxen figure. Then, being determined to test the truth of the spirit voices, he untied the girdle, and after much difficulty, extracted the enchanted pin from the folds. But still, Ethna spoke no word. Then he took the girdle and burned it with fire, and strewed the ashes before the door, and he buried the enchanted pin in a deep hole in the earth under a fairy thorn, that, that no hand might disturb the spot. After which he returned to his young wife, who smiled as she looked at him, and held forth her hand. Great was his joy to see the soul coming back to the beautiful form, and he raised her up and kissed her, and speech and memory came back to her at that moment, and all her former life, just as if it had never been broken or interrupted. But the year that her spirit had passed in fairyland seemed to her but as a dream in the night for which she had just awoke. After this, Finvara made no further efforts to carry her off, but the deep cut in the hill remains to this day, and is called the Fairy's Glen, so no one can doubt the truth of the story as here narrated. And that was Ethna the Bride. Very interesting. You know, there's one thing that they never addressed in this story, and I'm very curious about it. Um, the voices in the air. They never said who those were. And why were they helping him? Or were they perhaps just speaking generally and he was overhearing them? But why could only he hear them? That is something very interesting that I would like more lore on. What are the voices in the air that speak to the people about the fairies? Are they fairies themselves? Are they angels? Are they other fae-like forms that are benevolent and helpful? Are they tricksters? Seems like they helped him in this story. I don't know, I think I'd very much like to figure that out, but... I was also thinking there's a very interesting common thread in a lot of human lore, and that is eating forbidden fruit. <laughs> or, or eating food that you're not supposed to eat that somehow curses you, 
or prevents you from leaving, like Persephone in Hades. When Persephone eats the pomegranate from the underworld, she is prevented from leaving the underworld, at least for six months, and that's why, you know, the winter and spring and summer, those, those months exist, because Hera, whenever uh, Persephone is in the underworld, she's depressed, so it turns winter and cold and bitter, and whenever Persephone is on the human mortal realm, it's spring and summer, and everything's nice and warm and lovely. Um, of course, there's so much going on now about whether or not Persephone was truly trapped in the underworld, or if she chose to stay because she truly loved Hades, whole thing. Um, but there's also, um, of course, Eve and the apple. She ate the forbidden fruit. She was cursed to never see Eden. You know, things, things like that are a very common thread. There's, there's food that you should not eat as human beings, and I wonder if that develops from human beings knowing not to eat certain things and it just became a part of their culture and their stories. It is, is really interesting. And now we all know that in Ireland, if you were ever whisked away to a fairyland, um, don't eat the food because you'll never come back. Unless you want to stay. You know, I don't feel like that's a bad option. Maybe maybe it is. Maybe I'm just not learn, learned in the ways of the Irish fairy lore enough. Because where I come from, you can stay. It's nice. I feel like people are going to question me about that now. Anyway, so thank you so much for joining me for another story. I hope that you're all staying happy, healthy, and safe, and I look forward to seeing you next week.